Hi everyone, this is Jason, your professor. Uh, sorry, I'm coming to you from my office. Um, I was going to do a light board demonstration in my studio at home, but my technology would not agree with me this weekend. So I thought I better get something up on Blackboard for you to um, better understand neuronal communication. I told you that this is one of the more complicated um, talks. Therefore, I wanted to animate and draw and do as much as I could in the way of illuminating this process for you. To understand neuronal communication, we have to dive into the microscopic world of the brain. There you will find somewhere between 80 and 100 billion of these little nerve cells or neurons, as Wall Dyer in 1891 uh, first referred to them. Now, these little cells are massively interconnected. There's an incredible network of these little spider web looking cells that form the basis of you. Quite literally, everything you've ever thought, felt, or done, everything that you ever were, everything that you are, and everything that you will ever be is in most ways the result of this little tiny brain cell. Now it's not this single brain cell that gives animation or magic, as some neuroscientists believe, to you. It's this interconnectivity, this massive network of 80 to 100 billion of these little guys that makes you you. Now, that might seem extraordinary. That might seem amazing and, again, miraculous. And many neuroscientists believe that brain cells are incredible, but not all. One neuroscientist from Johns Hopkins is somewhat of a brain critic. Uh, he believes that in evolution, you never build something new if you can adapt something you've already got. David Linden believes that our brains are not that good. He believes that because our brains were basically constructed millions of years ago, beginning with jellyfish-like creatures, and then through evolution, evolving into reptiles, and then mice, and then only relatively recently us, that brain cells and brains are not perfect. In fact, Linden says that if a brain cell were a giant, imagine that it would have its <clears throat> head in Baltimore and its toe would be right off the coast of South Africa. Linden goes on to say if a great white shark bit that giant's toe off the coast of South Africa, that giant would not feel that bite until a couple of days later. And that giant would not move his toe until a couple of days after that. In other words, he argues that human brain cells are slow, sluggish. He believes they're leaky and inefficient. Now he says that the benefit of brain cells being massively interconnected is that we have so many neighbors we have such little distance that communication has to travel that we can have relatively slow brain cells. Where are neurons found? Well, obviously, since a neuron is a brain cell, they're found in the brain. But would you believe they're also found throughout the rest of the body? That's right. Brain cells are found both in the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. Now, there are other cells that are comprised by the nervous system besides brain cells or besides neurons. In fact, there are other brain cells called glia cells. Here are just three of them to illustrate the point. Oligodendrocytes, microglia, and astrocytes. These glia cells <clears throat> provide important support functions and help neurons receive and transmit in a healthy way. There are also three general types of neurons. 
sensory neurons, or what we call afferent neurons, interneurons, or what we call integration and processing neurons, as well as motor neurons that we also call efferent neurons. Now, sensory neurons or afferent neurons bring information from sense receptors into a structure of the nervous system, while interneurons, or what I might call processing neurons, have all of their parts in a given structure. Most of these interneurons are found in both the spinal cord to help with automatic reflex action, as well as the brain itself for processing much of which is conscious, conscious, some of which is unconscious. And finally, motor or output or efferent neurons take information from a structure in the nervous system to muscles and fibers. Motor neurons have axons that are typically longer, denser, and surrounded by a fatty insulated material made subsequently from glia cells called myelin. This makes neural communication much faster. Now, not all parts of a neuron are unique. In fact, if you take a look at this illustration, you'll notice some similarities between the contents of a neuron, a brain cell that is, and the contents of any cell you've ever learned about, including the plasma or cell membrane, the nucleus, the mitochondria, as well as ribosomes, and many, many other parts. Now, neurons also have parts that are exclusively found in neurons and not found in any other brain cell or any other cell throughout the body. These include the cell body or soma, dendrites, axons, axon terminals, myelin sheathing, and nodes of Ranvier. Now, what I'd like to do now is illustrate the parts that I just mentioned, the cell body, the dendrites, the axon, the axon terminal, myelin sheathing, and nodes of Ranvier. Now you will notice that the structures that I make in black are going to be components that you do not necessarily find in every neuron. The structures that I make in color are going to be the structures that all neurons have. So let's get started with red. The structure I'm drawing in red is known as the cell body or soma, if you'd like. Soma. Now, cell body or soma is nothing more than a region of the neuron that contains structures that nourish the cell contains DNA inside a component known as the nucleus and manufactures chemicals that this cell will need for communication called neurotransmitters. Now, most importantly, this cell body undergoes what's called graded potential. This is an internal calculus that is always at work trying to determine whether or not this neuron is ready to send messages to other neurons. In other words, the soma and its grading potential coordinates the neuroprocessing tasks that make communication within and between brain cells possible. Now, densely populated, I'll just put the nucleus here, densely populated cell bodies that can be found in different parts of the brain and spinal cord appear gray, appear gray. Sometimes this gives whole areas of the brain a gray appearance, which in turn we sometimes refer to as gray matter. Now in yellow, 
or orange, excuse me, I'm going to create some little fiber like spiny branches. Uh, I believe in Latin. These are actually called little trees. And these little trees we will call dendrites. Dendrites. They're spiny root like fibers that branch from the cell body or the soma for the primary purpose of receiving input from other neurons. Remember, one neuron in your brain on average is directly connected to a thousand others. So these individual dendrites that surround and connect to the cell body of this one neuron provides the conduit by which thousands of other neurons can communicate. The number and surface area of dendrites on a cell body correlates with the amount of input that neuron can receive. Not all neurons have the same size, shape, and number of dendrites. For instance, take the Purkinje neurons in the old part of the brain known as the cerebellum, for example. Purkinje neurons have large numbers of dendritic receptors that allow for as many as 200,000 inputs at once. By contrast, there are smaller scale dendritic surface areas on neurons in the retina. Inside the human eye, there are rods and cones with much shorter and much less numerous dendrites and therefore can only pool input from just a handful of sources. Now in green, I'm going to draw the long cylindrical tube-like projection, usually longer than dendrites that carry information away from the cell body or soma to other neurons, organs, and muscles. Uh, like their dendritic cousins, axons differ in size. It's particularly differing in length. Some axons are very short while others travel the distance of the entire human body. Some axons, <clears throat> excuse me, are very dense, uh, covered in a fatty insulated material called myelin. Remember myelin is manufactured by the glial cells. This myelin helps propagate or speed up the transmission of the communication within some neurons, within some neurons. Now, continuing on in green, I'm going to terminate the axon into these three branches or swellings that we will call terminal knobs, terminal buttons, or terminal endpoints, sometimes referred to in French as boutons. Most people just call these axon buttons, axon terminals, or axon knobs. Now, I said that I would also illustrate some components that not all neurons share, right? And we're going to do that in black. So the first thing I want to illustrate is the myelin sheathing. Myelin is a fatty insulative material made of glial cells that surrounds the axons of some but not all neurons. Myelin protects, insulates, and more importantly, helps to speed up or promulgate the electrochemical transmission or communication of any particular neuron. Neurons can send their electrochemical messages very slowly, about two miles an hour, or very quickly, 230 miles an hour. The ones that send information the quickest are typically what we call motor or efferent neurons. Remember I said efferent or motor neurons can sometimes span the length of the entire body from the tip of the head down to the tip of your toes. These are denser and subsequently more myelinated. About 95% of all motor neurons are 
myelinated in their axons. There are little interruptions or spaces, you might want to call them hiccups, along this axon where the myelin doesn't quite meet. Uh, think of this as homemade sausage with little pinch points in between the bulbous casings of sausage. Uh, these are called nodes, nodes of ran VA. Another French term, nodes of ran VA. And the nodes of ran VA just allow for the promulgation, the more quick promulgation of information flow through this axon. Instead of having to go the entire length of the axon, electrochemical activity can jump from one of these nodes to the next, working systematically down the length of the axon. So it's just a way to save time and to get the message from the soma down to the terminal buttons or boutons more quickly, more quickly. Now, <clears throat> a couple of other things that are important include these little vesicles that are stored inside the terminal buttons. These are microscopic in size. They're little packages that contain neurochemicals called neurotransmitters. And you know these neurotransmitters. Some of them are excitatory which means they encourage other neurons to fire messages. And some of these neurochemicals are inhibitory, meaning they discourage other neurons from firing messages. The most common inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters in the body, we're gonna talk about in a couple of seconds. Now there's a little space right outside of these terminal buttons, a little space that is referred to as the synapse, synapse. Remember, brain cells don't actually touch one another. They're interconnected without actually touching. They're interconnected without actually touching. That's because there's a small microscopic gap between the terminal buttons of one neuron's axon and we'll draw the other neuron or two in the same colors we drew the first with red soma orange dendrites green axons, and green terminal buttons. Now, not all axons have the same number of terminal buttons. Some may have more, some may have less, but most neurons do have just one axon. Now, as you can see, this microscopic space in black separates the terminal button of this original neuron from the dendrites of other neurons. On average, one neuron is connected directly to about 1,000 other neurons. Now, what I want to do is I want to go in here and I want to magnify this section here. I want to magnify this section here. And to do that, I'm going to come down and I'm going to draw a much larger 
axon terminal and a much larger dendritic receptor. Sometimes these are referred to as pre synaptic terminals, that is the axon terminal, and post synaptic receptors, that is the dendritic receptors of other neurons. Now, inside these little vesicles stored, but again, not manufactured, stored in the presynaptic terminal or the axon terminal or button or bouton, if you'd like, we have neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters, under the right circumstances, are released. They're released into the synapse. Released into the synapse. And the dendrites of nearby neurons await these molecules and they eventually will bind to little receptors in this post synaptic dendrite. There are many other parts to consider. Um, I would ask you to remember to take a look at um, axon hillock, perhaps swan cells, and any other term related to a neuron's structure that I did not mention in this presentation. They could be questions on the test, although it's doubtful. Now remember, neurotransmitters are really the alphabet by which your brain, specifically your brain cells, communicate messages. And this cacophony of messages, this pattern of electrochemical messages floating around within and between 100 billion neurons across 100 to 500 billion or 500 trillion synapses is what makes you you. It's what makes you think, feel, and behave the way you do. Now, I told you earlier that neurons, specifically neurotransmitters, can be excitatory. That is, increase the probability that any particular neuron or brain cell will fire a message, will communicate, will send an impulse, and they can also be inhibitory. That is, decrease the probability that any particular neuron will send a message or communicate. The most common excitatory neurochemical in the brain is called glutamate. Glutamate. We have more of this excitatory neurochemical in the brain than any other excitatory chemical. The most common inhibitory chemical in the brain is called GABA. Now, glutamate always excites the neurons it comes into contact with, while GABA always inhibits the neurons it comes in contact with. More on excitatory and inhibitory processes a bit later. Now, by now, you should know that messages travel within a neuron using electrical signals, but communication between neurons depend on the movements of chemicals, these chemicals that we call neurotransmitters. We reviewed several of those already, and we'll review a few more later in this lecture. Though they all work in the same way, there are many different types of neurotransmitters, each linked to unique effects on behavior. However, drugs and other substances known as agonists and antagonists can alter the process of communication between neurons by boosting in the case of an agonist or blocking in the case of an antagonist normal neurotransmitter activity. Let's take nicotine, for instance. 
nicotine is an agonist. An agonist boosts normal neurotransmitter activity. Nicotine mimics acetylcholine and causes the same activation in the receptors of your brain that acetylcholine create. In other words, nicotine makes the receptors that normally respond to acetylcholine more sensitive, more receptive to acetylcholine. So this actually interferes with learning, memory, and other processes associated with acetylcholine activity in your brain. Now, an antagonist, again, is a chemical that blocks neurotransmission. Think about Botox. If wrinkles are formed from the successive um, puffing that your lips and face have to undergo, contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing when taking puffs of cigarettes for long periods of time, perhaps years, then Botox might possibly fix this, at least temporarily. That is because Botox, which originates from a neurotoxin called botulin, is a pharmaceutical grade derivative that blocks the receptors for acetylcholine in the muscles, including the muscles of your face. Under normal circumstances, acetylcholine animates the muscles of your face by stimulating the receptors in the muscle that respond to acetylcholine. This is normal contraction and relaxation of muscles, whether they be large or small in your face or in your biceps. Now, Botox will go in and selectively hone in on the small muscles of your face, or at least depending on where the injection site is, and it will block acetylcholine receptors so that they can no longer contract. In essence, they can only relax. Now this only lasts for about a month, maybe six at the most, and it can be quite expensive, but I just thought I would, wanted, would share that you can think about Botox when you think about antagonistic communication, and you can think about nicotine when you're thinking about agonistic communication. And there's many, many other examples of each of these two processes. So now it's this point in the recorded lecture to talk about exactly how a neuron signals me or you. How does it make me me or you you? And again, it's important to realize that it doesn't, at least not a single neuron by itself. It's not capable of such a feat. A single neuron has just a slightly electrical, a slight electrical charge, a slight polarization of about negative 70 millivolts. By comparison, a AA battery has 1500 millivolts. So you might say that one single neuron by itself is the equivalent in terms of its electrical power as one two hundredth of a AA battery. In fact, all of your brain's billion neurons working together would be just enough voltage maybe to power a 100 watt light bulb. So what exactly is going on here? For demonstration purposes, I'm going to draw a single neuron connected with a, another single neuron. But remember, neurons are connected to uh, 1,000 on average and as many as 10,000 other neurons directly, but we simply don't have the space on the screen for that. So the first thing I wanna mention is that neurons are surrounded by a membrane. And that this membrane is porous. So here we go. We're going to draw a neuron. And in yellow, I'm going to indicate 
as best I can a membrane. Like any cell membrane, this membrane separates the outside of the cell right from the inside of the cell now like many membranes this one is porous and as such that means that some molecules that are floating around outside the cell can enter through the cell membrane and some molecules that are inside the cell can exit through these cell membranes now at the same time some molecules are not capable of passing through the membrane at all what animates this particular cell is electrochemical or neural energy electrochemical or neural energy now what do we mean by electrochemical or neural energy well let's take a look at the electrical part first I said earlier that a single neuron has a slight electrical charge of negative 70 millivolts uh, what is responsible for this imbalance this polarization this negative 70 millivolt charge well it's quite simple there are more negative ions negative charges inside the membrane than outside the membrane more negative charges inside the membrane than outside the membrane now to be sure there are both positive and negative charges inside and outside any cell membrane in a brain cell but there's just more negative ions negatively charged molecules inside than outside these ions as I just said are found inside and outside the cell membrane now <clears throat> under normal circumstances each brain cell has a pump this pump is called the sodium and potassium pump and what it does is it pumps out three molecules of sodium which is a positively charged molecule for every two molecules Of potassium leaving the inside with quite a bit more sodium than potassium now sodium and potassium are both positively charged so that's not going to have a huge impact on this polarization this negative 70 millivolts what has the greatest impact on this negative 70 millivolts is the fact that the sodium potassium pump for the most part is keeping more sodium outside and slightly more potassium inside again leaving the cell slightly negatively charged or slightly polarized as we call it again the average neuron undergoes a resting potential that is it is at rest it has the potential of animating it has the potential of communicating at negative 70 millivolts again this is caused by an electrical gradient that is imbalanced between the inside and the outside of the cell 
Now, there's also leakage going on. There are little channels all along the cell membrane. Again, I said the cell membrane is porous and leaky. There are little channels. These channels allow potassium to flow in and out. Not freely, but seepage leakage does occur. So potassium can flow in and out of these channels. But sodium gets stuck where it is. Now, since there's more sodium outside, thanks to the sodium potassium pump pumping three sodiums out for every two uh, potassiums, there's more sodium out here than there is inside. And some of that sodium, I'd say a lot of that sodium inside is getting pumped out by the sodium potassium pump. But the sodium that's outside can't leak or seep its way back in through the channels. They're pretty much closed to sodium. The only way sodium can get in is through the sodium potassium pump. Now I'm going to erase some of this. When a neuron is at rest, negative 70 millivolts, disruption is required in order to animate it, in order to make it talk, in order to make it communicate or make it generate an impulse. And to do that, most neurons require a disruption of a certain amount of stimulation. This stimulus within any particular neuron that is necessary for disruption to occur is called the stimulus threshold. In the neuron illustrated here, we're going to use the negative 65 millivolt threshold. And if you look at a number line where zero is in the middle and negative 70 millivolts is over here to your left, you'll notice that we need to move back in the positive direction. Just five millivolts to negative 65 in order to make something happen. That means the stimulus threshold is really just five millivolts worth of excitatory messages because five millivolts of excitement will move the negative 70 in the positive direction to negative 65. It might be kind of hard to visualize, but negative 65 is more positive than negative 70. When there is enough stimulation coming from other neurons, specifically the neurotransmitters from their axon terminals in through the dendrites of any given neuron. When there's enough stimulation to change the polarity, to change the polarization from negative 70 millivolts to negative 65 millivolts under normal circumstances on average, and all or none process occurs. This means that these little tiny porous channels that sodium cannot leak into, but potassium can leak in and out of, open up wide. They open up very wide, allowing this sodium that's trapped outside here outside the membrane when the neuron is at rest to rush into the cell membrane. At negative 65 millivolts, these ion channels will open wide and sodium will rush into the cell membrane. All that's necessary for this all or none process to occur is for the negative 70 millivolt resting potential to be disrupted five millivolts in the excitatory direction. If there is not enough disruption 
to move this negative 70 millivolt resting potential to negative 65 millivolts on average, then nothing will happen. Merely a graded potential will occur. Remember the soma is responsible for grading or determining if and when the threshold makes it to negative 65 millivolts. Remember these inputs, these neurochemical inputs from the axon terminals across the synapse from other neurons can have inhibitory and or excitatory effects on any given neuron. And the soma is grading these effects. So some neurochemicals like glutamate are gonna excite a neuron while GABA have no choice but to inhibit the neuron. So you'd need significantly more glutamate stimulation than GABA stimulation in order to animate this particular neuron we're looking at because you'd need more excitatory messages, the kind that glutamate inspires, than inhibitory messages, the kind that GABA inspires. What else could you do to strengthen or to increase the excitatory messages entering any given brain cell? Besides increasing the excitatory neurotransmitters themselves? That's right, you could do this with a prescribed drug or a recreational drug, an agonist, like the one we talked about earlier, like nicotine, for instance. When differentially more inhibitory signals enter any given cell body, it can send the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts into the opposite direction. Instead of moving it towards the stimulus threshold, it can move it away from the stimulus threshold. It can move it to negative 80, negative 90, negative 100. Uh, this is called hyperpolarization. And what this means is, is it's gonna take an awful lot more excitatory messages and or agonistic messages to overcome this hyperpolarization. You see from negative 70 to negative 65 only takes five millivolts, but from a hyperpolarized state of say negative 100, it would take nearly 35, 40 excitatory millivolts just to get it to that stimulus threshold. Depolarization is the name we give to a polarized cell body and subsequently a polarized neuron that is moving away from negative 70 in the positive direction towards negative 65 millivolts. So you would say um, in order to animate or to make this neuron fire an impulse, you need for depolarization to occur and it needs to be sufficient to overcome the graded potential within the cell body. It needs to be sufficient so that it makes it to at least negative 65 millivolts on average. If and when the average neuron reaches negative 65 millivolts in its soma, an action potential will be spawned. An action potential will begin. And it always begins here where the dendrite, excuse me, where the cell body meets the beginning of the axon, known as the axon hillock. And what is gonna happen is that once this cell body, specifically this axon hillock, uh, reaches negative 65 millivolts, these little porous channels are gonna open more wide, allowing sodium to rush in. This is going to start what's called an action potential. This is a dramatic change in the polarity of this neuron, one segment of the axon at a time. 
The action potential begins at the stimulus threshold of negative 65 millivolts. And before the action potential is complete, the polarity of any particular section of this axon will become reversed in its polarity. It'll become as high as plus 40 millivolts, plus 40 millivolts. Now that has an impact on the refiring rate of any given neuron. That has an impact on the refiring rate of any given neuron. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is if a neuron rests at negative 70 and it requires just five millivolts in order to reach its threshold of negative 65, before an action potential can occur, and an action potential can send the polarity of any particular section of this axon to as high as plus 40 millivolts, you will need recovery, rest, or what we call refraction. You'll need a period, typically less than one millisecond. So this is happening very fast. A period of less than one millisecond in order for this negative 40 millivolt charge to get back to negative 70 millivolts. You need time for the sodium potassium to resettle, time for these um, wide open channels to close back up, time for the sodium and potassium pump to pump this now excess sodium back out of the inside of the membrane at a rate of three for every two potassium. Again, just a quick review if you'd like. A brain cell is another name for a neuron. Neurons are made of basic parts. All of, all of the neurons in your brain and body have dendrites, cell bodies, axon and axon terminals. Of course, many neurons have other parts. The resting potential of any given neuron is about negative 70 millivolts. That's an electrical gradient referred to as polarization. This electrical gradient is in large part the result of having more sodium molecules outside of the cell brain membrane than it has inside and more potassium molecules inside the cell membrane than it has on the outside. Um, fundamentally, a sodium and potassium pump that is always running to help um, maintain balance or what we call homeostasis is pumping out three sodium molecules from inside a neuron cell membrane for every two potassium molecules that it pumps out, leaving an imbalance of sodium on the inside versus potassium on the outside. Uh, this <clears throat> gives the neuron a resting charge of about negative 70 millivolts. Remember, negative 70 millivolts is not that much. Uh, it would take 200 AA batteries to get the same amount of stimulation. Excuse me, it would take 200 neurons to get the same stimulation as one, or same voltage, as one AA battery. Now, when a neuron, any neuron is in its resting state, normally negative 70 millivolts, you need disruption. Uh, specifically, you need stimulation, a particular type of stimulation. You need excitation, right? Because excitation, the likes of which um, glutamate does, is going to increase the likelihood that the brain cell is going to fire an action potential. Those inputs that do not sufficiently help the inside of that cell membrane reach negative 65 or reach the stimulus threshold are called graded potentials. The stimulus threshold, when that occurs, we say depolarization has begun. When the stimulus threshold occurs, 
you know that you've reached negative 65 millivolts, which is just five millivolts in the positive direction. This is the beginning of the action potential. This is the beginning of a series of electrochemical um, processes that jump from one segment to the next down the length of the axon. And once this action potential begins, once this stimulus threshold is reached, an all or none principle begins to apply, meaning it doesn't matter how little or how much incoming stimulation occurs. If there is sufficient, if there is enough incoming stimulation to move the resting potential to that negative 65 stimulus threshold, then an action potential will occur every single time. Again, the action potential is a period of reversed polarity because an action potential will take that neuron's electrical gradient that was once polarized at negative 70 and move it very quickly to zero and beyond 30 plus 40 millivolts. And finally, before any particular neuron can fire again, before it can respond again to incoming stimulation, it will need to undergo what's called a refractory period. It'll need to undergo what's called hyperpolarization. And what this means is there'll be a time in which post action potential, a neuron has to recover before it can get back to the negative 70 millivolt rest. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you um, use this at your leisure to help you with the upcoming test. Thank you guys for listening and I'll see you in class Monday and Wednesday. Bye-bye.